You guys here? We're here. The attendees are ticking up, so we'll give it uh, just a couple of minutes and then jump in. And we can see you, Tara. Okay, welcome everyone. It looks like we've got a good crowd here. And I'd like to welcome you all to the second Zephyr virtual learning session. Today's topic is perspective and retrospective views of uncertainty in travel forecasting. I'm Greg Erhard from the University of Kentucky. Uh, and we're gonna have two excellent presenters today, Dan Engelberg and Jawad Hawk, and then two discussants, Rachel Copperman and Tara Widener, uh, who will respond to some of what they have and hopefully generate a bit of discussion. Uh, we'd like to get your input on this. Um, first, I'd remind you, start with a few reminders. First, um, by participating, you agree to our code of conduct, which basically means be nice to each other. Um, if you have questions, there's two ways to do this. Put your questions in the chat box, and if you could, make sure it says to all panelists and attendees. Um, and what we'll do is I'll try to kind of keep track of the questions and stop and discuss and um, pose those to our panelists as we go. Uh, I'd actually prefer it if you're interested in asking your own questions, just put that in the chat box and we can unmute you, let you ask your question and participate in the discussion directly. Um, the way this is gonna work is um, uh, I'll give sort of an intro talk, uh, set the stage. Jawad and uh, Dan will each present for about 15 minutes. Then Tara and Rachel will um, uh, respond and then we'll have some open discussion. A reminder as well that we're recording and if you have um, technical issues reach out to um, the email address there or in the Zoom chat and Elizabeth is here kind of helping manage some of that. Okay so hopefully uh, some of you may have seen this up on the TRB website this week that the forecasting through COVID-19 will be crucial for the future of transportation. This is a blog post they have. And the argument there, the case is that, um, the issue is that uncertainty happens. No one, I think none of us reasonably anticipated this. And all of a sudden our forecasts are, are wrong and off. Um, there's stuff that happens that we don't anticipate that we, when we make a forecast. And it's not just COVID-19. You look back over the past 40 years or so, and you had a global financial crisis uh, 10 years ago. You had September 11th before that. 
the Berlin Wall came down in 1989, sort of the repercussions of that had a tremendous influence on travel throughout Europe, uh, oil crises in the 70s. Uh, we're in the business of making forecasts with the 20 year horizon and there's these big giant unexpected events uh, that we've seen every 10 years or so uh, that we're not necessarily good at anticipating. In addition, there's um, sort of broader trends uh, uh, that also influence our forecast, some of which we may be able to anticipate and some of which we may not. Uh, you've had over the same period car ownership growth and then sort of eventual saturation, uh, suburbanization, and then sort of the regrowth of the center cities, uh, uh, which you might not have expected in the 1990s. Uh, the rise of internet and smartphones and sort of globalization and trade and freight travel uh, have gone up tremendously over this period as well. So how do we manage and incorporate this into our forecast? Well, as, as it turns out, I didn't start out kind of looking at this or wanting to study uncertainty. I started wanting to look at traffic forecast accuracy. Um, do we get the right answer when we forecast? Um, and in doing so, this is a NCHRP research report 934, was just finally published last week. Uh, but as we did that, uh, we ended up with four core recommendations coming out of there. Um, first was to use a range of forecasts to communicate uncertainty. Um, that's coming out of an accuracy presentation. Second is to sort of archive your traffic forecast, collect observed data so you can compare the two, periodically report the accuracy of your forecast, and then consider that in improving, uh, uh, assessing and improving our forecasting methods. Uh, so this is sort of a big picture agenda for improving traffic forecasting uh, that goes beyond specific methods. In doing this, we need to consider what makes a forecast good. Um, and so there's a view uh, sort of proposed by Murphy in 1993 that basically forecast should be beneficial to decision making. Well, what this means is this means a couple of things. One thing it means uh, it ought to be sensitive to the policies that are of interest to us. If we want to test pricing policies, we need a forecast that's sensitive to pricing. Um, second is it ought to produce metrics that are actually useful to decision making, something the decision makers want to know and care about. Uh, and then we want it to correspond to reality. Uh, sort of a slightly different view, sort of proposed by uh, Volgaris in 2019, is a forecast is good uh, or bad, depending on whether the decision would change for a different forecast and whether the unselected decision would lead to a better outcome. And this metric depends upon the context. In capacity planning, a conservative forecast might be one that uh, errs on the high side so I can build enough capacity. In sort of investment decision-making, maybe uh, I wanna err on the low side so I make sure I can cover my revenue. So the context matters in how the decision is making there. And kind of putting this together, uh, what we want is we want both better forecasts, more accurate inputs, and better mathematical models, but we also want the uncertainty to be conveyed in those, and we want the policy decisions to consider that range. And, and one thing that's worth noting here is that when we do acknowledge that there is uncertainty, it actually builds our own credibility as forecasters in a way, because what we do is if we're off by 20%, well, that opens up to criticism. Maybe that's a bad forecast. We were off by 20%. But if we say, here's our forecast and it's plus or minus uh, 30% and we're within that range, well then maybe that's a success instead. And so we want to, by being honest and transparent about that, um, we can help to build sort of uh, uh, expectations here. Now, what we can see is we can look at this accuracy and uncertainty as sort of two sides of the same coin. Accuracy is looking backwards and comparing accurate, actual and forecasted traffic, whereas uncertainty is looking forwards and looking at what the actual traffic may be relative to what our forecast is. Um, and you can see that these things go together, if you will. The accuracy is sort of the inherent uncertainty observed in past forecasts, uh, and the uncertainty is the uncertainty expected in future forecasts. And there's a couple of different ways of dealing with uncertainty in forecasting. Uh, Jawad Hawk is going to talk about a retrospective view, and that's looking at uh, uh, the accuracy side of the coin and what that says about uncertainty. 
Dan Engelberg is uh, going to take a perspective view and say, well, if we expect these sorts of things are things that may be wrong, how can we capture that? Both are PhD students and both are very talented individuals that I expect you're going to be hearing more from in the next few years. Jawad's at University of Kentucky working with me. Dan is at MIT. Uh, Jawad is working on forecast accuracy and the causes of transit ridership decline, while Dan is looking at adaptive methods and computational tools for uncertainty. And as they present, I want us to consider sort of two axioms. And this is kind of the goal for today, as we look at sort of these contrasting cases where past performance is no guarantee of future results, but also you can look at the past to inform the future, even if things are different. That one is from Hannah Rakoff in last week's learning session, um, uh, which I thought was sort of a nice way of looking at it. Uh, so how do we put these things together uh, going forward? And uh, the folks who will start us off with that are Rachel Copperman from Cambridge Systematics and Carol Widener from Oregon DOT. And I've asked them to provide some comments along the lines of what's useful in each of these approaches, what are the trade-offs, and is there a way that each can learn from the other? Uh, so after the two presentations, they'll provide some comments, and the four, uh, both the two speakers and our two respondents will then be available for responding to questions after that. With that, um, well, I'll note here that there's a few sessions coming up. Check out separatetransport.org, become a member as well. And with that, I'm going to pass it off to Jawad for the first talk. Uh, is it on? Yep. All right. Um, thank you very much. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, thanks for being here. My presentation today is a product of our research work on NCHFP 934, um, where we looked at the state of accuracy of traffic forecast in the United States. Um, as Greg had mentioned before, accuracy and uncertainty uh, are connected, are connected concepts, uh, especially uh, not just in the context of transportation planning, but in forecasting and planning in general. So where accuracy is a measure of closeness of observation and prediction, uncertainty is an estimate of the accuracy itself. Um, so once you know how accurate your forecast have been in the past, you can adjust your forecasts based on that knowledge. So why is it necessary? Um, in short, it's uh, because predicting the future is a risky business indeed. Um, there are so many things that can go wrong. Your inputs are full of uncertainty themselves. So policy should account for this uncertainty in the forecast. I mean, it should consider what would happen if a particular forecast display similar level of inaccuracy as past forecasts. Would the decision change? Can the decision absorb the risk? So this uncertainty comes in the form of a range of values possible for actual traffic or the spread. Um, there have been quite a few studies, uh, but uh, most of the studies have to be content with just the general measure of inaccuracy. Very few were actually able to identify systematic biases on uh, explanatory variables. Um, even when they did, they did an analysis on a very small sample, and um, so which was not enough to uh, base any decision on. So the short review of the literature is uh, while accuracy was studied on the uncertainty, not so much in, in the sense we are presenting here today. One of the rare few studies was a continuation of Standard & Poor's research on traffic forecast accuracy on toll roads. Robert Bine conducted a survey of 40 professionals uh, about their estimate of forecast reasonableness, how much they expected their, uh, ac the actual traffic to deviate from their forecasts. So the variables were uh, the forecast horizon, uh, how many years into the future they're forecasting, and the forecast type, whether it's on a new road or, a, or an existing roadway. So he constructed a sort of uh, focused envelope, uncertainty envelope. Only trouble is the envelope is not based on any empirical results, just an estimate of the response best guesses, I guess. So uh, this is not to say that constructing uncertainty envelope is an entirely new concept. Um, we see it in practice as sensitivity tests, scenario analysis, and Monte Carlo simulations. So all of these methods uh, measure elasticity of travel demand with respect to the upper and lower limits of the input variables. You run the model with extreme values of the inputs, you get sensitivity analysis, 
you run it with the most likely optimistic and pessimistic values. You get scenario analysis and uh, you run the model enough times considering the probability distribution of the inputs you get Monte Carlo simulations. But these have limitations. Uh, they assume about the, they make a lot of assumptions about the range of inputs, uh, the upper limits, lower limits, even the most likely pessimistic, optimistic scenarios are randomly defined. And uh, this uncertainty in the input data propagates through the model as demonstrated in, in this paper from Chow and Kokoman. Um, uh, in addition, uh, testing variables one at a time does not address the complex relationship among themselves. And uh, perhaps most importantly, uh, they add several times to the already uh, time intensive process of model running. So uh, the other way to address this uncertainty, and uncertainty is uh, um, employing what Asher calls outsiders approach and Tversky calls uh, reference class for us. This, this concept is uh, basically using past performance to uh, modify future forecasts. And this is done using base rate and distribution results from similar situations in the past to adjust the forecasts. Uh, in this research, we have done, we have employed that the principle of reference class or outsider's view to create uncertainty envelopes. So we consider the spread of the variables that induce the bias. For example, for traffic forecast, these, uh, these variables may be the roadway functional class, whether the forecast is done for a interstate or a, a local roadway or even or the project type, whether it's a new construction project or an existing roadway. For transit ridership, it could be by the locality type, transit or auto-oriented, high or low population density area, even project type, rail or bus route developments, etc. because all of these behave differently. Um, so the way we do it is, is using a method called quantile regression. Uh, the ordinary least square regression is drawing lines through the middle of the cloud. In quantile regression, we draw lines along the edge of the cloud so that uh, so that a certain percent of data points fall within within that value. So, um, for example, if we if we draw these two lines, uh, what, so that ninety percent of the data points fall within this range, we can say that um, uh, if uh, we can say that the range produced by the regression lines denote 90% of the for past forecast with similar conditions. So if there is not a drastic change in the travel behavior, like this current COVID-19 lockdown, or even a sudden surge of CAVs, we can expect that our new forecast would be within this range. It's, it's because this 90% of the forecasts are made using similar methodology, similar assumptions. Uh, since we have uh, constructed this, uh, these lines using the principle of reference class, so uh, it considers the range of input data and uncertainty. It's kind of like using a proxy for input variability. And uh, the method uh, uh, and constructing the um, uncertainty envelope becomes very simple because it's as simple as inputting values in a spreadsheet and drawing lines, which we'll, I will show you a bit later. Um, the starting point for this work is a paper by Oleg and Weld in 2017, where they propose a regression model that estimates the actual traffic volume as a function of the forecast volume. So uh, the forecasts are unbiased if alpha and beta are not significantly different from zero. Um, we extend zero and one. Uh, we extend this methodology uh, to identify specific factors that may be associated with bias which we include as a set of regressors. For example, we can test if we're systematically uh, under predicting or over predicting traffic on, uh, on roads of a particular facility type. We include that facility type as a dummy variable in the model. And we also you multiply, uh, multiply the values by the focus of traffic volume, which uh, makes them operate as a scaling factor. Uh, they change the slope of the line rather than uh, shifting the lines up or down. Um, and we estimate separate alpha, beta, gamma values for different percentile values, 95th, 80th, so on. Um, and uh, coefficients signify the effect of explanatory variables on different percentile values. For example, uh, if we have a coefficient of minus 0.25 on unemployment rate on the 95th percentile model, it means that with each increase, 
you need increasing unemployment rate, the 93th percentile actual traffic value decreases by 0.25 units. Um, the data for this research uh, is collected as part of the NCHFU 934 project. We have about 2,600 unique projects with 16,000 segments of links. The mean percent deviation from forecast is minus 0.73%, uh, minus 5.73%, sorry. Uh, the mean absolute percent deviation of forecast is 78.29%. This database contains information, project information, forecast information, and uh, actual traffic count. The final analysis was based on a you know, reduced data set of about 1291 uh, unique, unique projects. Um, so we estimated three different models. Uh, the first one, simple model, where we replaced actual traffic count against forecast traffic. This detects the bias. The second one was an inference model, where we regressed using uh, Every, uh, uh, all the significant, uh, statistically significant explanatory variables we could find from our database. And this can be a performance metric for agencies uh, who uh, forecast the traffic. And the last one is a forecasting model where we uh, used only the variables that are known at the time of forecasts. Uh, the idea, idea is once you uh, produce your forecast, you use these variables to uh, estimate the uncertainty envelope. Let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, first one is a simple model where, where we have the actual traffic regressed as a function of the forecast traffic. So for, uh, for example, the A95th or the 95th percentile actual traffic is about uh, 3000 plus 1.42 times the forecast value, which means only 5% of the projects go over this line, this 95th percentile line. Similar, similarly, for the fifth percentile line, only 5% uh, projects go below this line. This one is the perfect forecast, and the yellow line is the median percentile. So the 50th or median percentile measures the bias. The fifth and ninth fifth percentile measures the spread. Um, for the forecast model, uh, we use all these variables that are known at the time of forecast, as I've said earlier. Uh, we use, uh, so the way to interpret it, uh, okay, the highlighted cells are the ones that are not statistically significant. Um, the way to interpret is uh, that if everything else remains equal, the fifth percentile actual traffic is about 70% of the uh, forecast traffic. Um, the median is about the 90% and the 95th percentile is about 125% of the forecast value. Other variables of note here, um, unemployment rate in the year forecast is produced. Um, so um, uh, it negatively affects the fifth percentile traffic, but positively affects the 50th and uh, 95th, percentile, uh, 95th percentile traffic. So uh, the way to interpret is uh, variables with, uh, you know, different signs in the different percentile values. Uh, will are associated with more precise forecasts. I mean, that those narrow the forecast, uh, the answer in the window. But it also must be considered how they interact with the other terms in the model. Um, let's uh, walk through an example. So let's say you have a forecast produced in the year 2018 and you are forecasting the traffic for 2028. That is the forecast horizon is 10 years. Let's say the unemployment rate at state level in 2018 is 4%. You are forecasting, uh, the project is a new construction project on a minority wheel, and the forecast is done using a travel demand model. Let me end the show for a bit and go over this spreadsheet. Um, as I've said before, the unemployment rate in the year forecast was produced is 4%. Since it was uh, forecasted in 2018, there is the, the dummy variable for 2010 should remain zero. The difference diff year variable is the um, forecast horizon. So it should be 10 here. You are, you are forecasting for a new roadway. So let's put it as a one, the binary variable. And you are forecasting using a travel demand model. So let's put a one here. And minor arterial is a reference class. So 
arterial and collector uh, collector local we are not putting anything so using this spreadsheet you get this this uh, uh, chart right here which denotes the uncertainty envelope using past forecasts and the way to interpret it is let's say you have a forecast of uh, 20000 traffic the fifth percentile value is about 18,000 and the 95th percentile is about 27,000. So you can be, uh, you can say that historically uh, for forecast, user forecast done on similar set of roadways, display 90% uh, of them have actual traffic between 18,000 to 27,000. And it essentially gives you a forecast envelope, uh, uh, uncertain envelope. Um, these Excel sheets, guidance document on how to use use this spreadsheet, the research report as well are available as in CHFB 934. The archiving software uh, is hosted on GitHub as well as the data. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jawad. Um, Let's see, I'm going to uh, hold off questions until uh, the rest of our speakers have gone and then we'll sort of field them from there. Uh, but I'm gonna pass it off to Dan to talk about some of his work uh, uh, doing uncertainty scenarios. One moment. Two. Does everyone see the person? Great. Uh, so I am in the world of transportation, but I am specifically coming from the world of urban studies and planning. So I'm going to look at the land use impacts of autonomous vehicles or automated vehicles. Um, I hope that everyone in the audience can appreciate the connection to transportation is not merely the automated vehicle. Um, but the well understood cycle between land use and transportation. Uh, so because I heard what Jawad was gonna be speaking about, I did a little bit of research in my own, on my own into how well land use projections have performed in the past. Um, I'm not trying to pick on the Washington Council of Governments here. This is actually a compliment to them because they make all of their forecasts available back to 1976, um, which, I could not find um, for several other agencies. Um, so you can see here a couple of cases, uh, one being a Washington DC. Uh, at first they refused to acknowledge uh, the decline of the inner city uh, and then they finally acknowledged it and yet things had turned around and population was booming again. Uh, we can also see Loudoun County, Virginia. Um, what started out as a very exurban county uh, all of a sudden it exploded into now a suburban county um, and the forecast persistently under projected Loudoun County. Uh, so I looked at the forecast for all of the eight jurisdictions that were included in the forecast back to 1976. Uh, you can see kind of the mean squared error exploding uh, as we get to forecasts that are 20 or more years out. Um, but what may be even more interesting is the bias is increasing as we go further and further out. In fact, looking 20 plus years out, um, there's a pretty strong negative bias uh, to all the forecasts. So this is just setting the world up where, you know, if we're thinking about either land use concerns or transportation concerns, um, in the long run, our forecasts um, have a uh, pretty wide uh, range of accuracy. Uh, and are often biased as well. Uh, but I want to think less about getting a particular correct forecast or range of correct forecasts uh, and think more about what policies uh, work well in a variety of forecasts. I really appreciate how uh, Greg defined accuracy of forecast because it was in terms of the usefulness uh, of our policies when applied through them. Uh, so instead of thinking about most likely futures or a range of most likely futures, think about which policies are robust to the range of possible futures. Um, and instead of a mere stochastic variation around the probable futures, uh, start thinking about 
um, really fundamental changes in uh, behavior and in the dynamics uh, and what conditions would favor one policy versus another. Uh, so to think about this, I'm using a scenario discovery approach. Some of you I know are already familiar um, with this way of thinking, um, but for the rest of you, I'll reintroduce it. So very often we start with an original baseline, uh, but in scenario discovery, we wanna think about a variety of baselines. Um, in this case, uh, we're gonna think about a situation uh, with just two primary uncertainties, uh, but you can have uh, any number which makes sense to your project or to the situation you're trying to make policy in. So you, in this case, I'm using a Latin hypercube sample, um, which is a simply an efficient way of sampling our uncertainty space to get as unlike scenarios as possible. Uh, and then on top of each of those futures, we test our policies. So we're not comparing policies from different across futures. We only compare policies um, within the same uncertainty scenario. Uh, that way we're comparing kind of apples to apples, not you know which policy does well in the AV future and which one does well in the more conventional view, uh, future of being compared to each other. We wanna compare them, we wanna compare the policies in the same kind of future. Uh, so then we start to think about how we compare the policy performance within a future. Uh, so we're gonna think about regret. First, we line up all of those scenarios or all of those futures that were the best performing within a particular scenario. And then we look at their performance relative to that best performing future. Uh, so the score of regret is essentially what was lost by not taking the best policy, policy strategy given that scenario that we've entered. Um, and then in the case of scenario discovery, we often set up some sort of threshold in which we declare certain policies, failures versus successes. Um, in the case of my research, I often use kind of the median level of regret, um, but in actual planning processes, uh, the experts at the table and the public might have certain thresholds that are really important. You can think of that particularly with environmental indicators um, where crossing a particular threshold uh, might have very steep consequences. Uh, so now we can map out all of our scenarios, all within a policy, we can map out our scenarios according to whether they were a success or a failure. And we can use an algorithm called the patient rule induction method to very simply draw boxes around the failed future. So now you can see in this case, when uncertainty B is at its high level and uncertainty A is at a low level, um, then this policy is not really operating as we'd like. Um, so we can start to think about kind of signposts and indicators of when we might be heading in that direction in the long-term future. Uh, but I have these real questions about what is the value of all this complexity and particularly, do we need the LHS sample? Uh, one thing that's very true about land use modeling and very true about a lot of large scale transportation modeling is it's very computationally intensive and we wanna make good use of these resources. Um, the LHS sample, uh, in my case, I will go on and show you, I use 100, sam uh, uh, 100 uncertainty points uh, over six uncertainties. Uh, but you can imagine that increases very quickly. Uh, the professionals that really introduced these um, scenario discovery techniques uh, were running thousands or tens of thousands of scenarios um, using very quick strategic models. Um, so there's a question of how we port this technique to these more intensive um, kind of behaviorally realistic models that we work with. Uh, and in particular, I'm interested in knowing how scenario discovery compares to a more traditional way we think of developing scenarios. Um, I refer to it by the name of exploratory scenarios. Uh, this is a process I'm sure a lot of you have seen or been a part of where you get a lot of experts to think of important driving forces and tell you know, a handful of stories about the future. Um, so you really end up with uh, a much 
smaller number of scenarios, but they're very narratively rich um, and thus kind of more useful for communicating with the public. Uh, so the way I thought of this is to compare how my Latin hypercube sample performs analytically um, to a couple other uh, sampling approaches. One is what I dubbed exploratory scenarios where we look at kind of the extreme corners because that's the way that I think a lot of exploratory scenarios get interpreted. Oh, gas prices are gonna be high or low. AVs are going to be present or not present. Uh, so that was one uh, sampling approach I compared to. Uh, the other was to simply take the convex hull of the Latin hypercube. So we're looking at the kind of perimeter uh, of the scenarios that uh, we're considering and thinking about whether we can get, uh, we can learn about the robustness of our policies and the contingencies involved um, without including a lot of those central um, scenarios, which I think also kind of reflects in a way the exploratory scenario approach. So very quickly, uh, the model at, that I'm working with is Silo, the Simple Integrated Land Use Orchestrator. Um, it's been set up in a number of regions. I'm looking at uh, the Maryland region. Uh, you can see in a map here, I, we've kind of divided up, it up into four subregions, looking at either the core jurisdictions, the inner suburbs, which have been developed for some time, the outer suburbs, which still have a lot of greenfield development space. Uh, and then you can see that there's also this area beyond the region. Uh, silo is a micro simulation model um, that uh, captures the individual choices of in households of where to work and where to live. Uh, so I'm gonna go over the policies, indicators, and the kind of the uncertainties that we're looking at um, in this experiment. Uh, so I'm looking at a baseline, which includes kind of, or baselines for each of the uncertainty points. Um, that includes no policy overlay. Uh, I'm looking at two versions of transit-oriented development. One in our start year of 2015. Um, one is a delayed implementation. I should say that this instantiation of silo was developed several years ago. So the start year is now the past. Um, and then I'm looking at two fuel tax scenarios. Um, the implementation uh, is based, the way that these policies were implemented um, we're based on kind of review of previous literature, uh, but should be taken to be kind of more heuristic truth. Um, we're more interested in the method um, than the specific accuracy of the policy, um, though we attempt to capture that as well. Uh, and then I'm looking at eight indicators. Um, these are different indicators that we're attempting to maximize or minimize uh, depending on our value system. Uh, the important thing here is, you know, why you look at eight instead of one or two. Uh, I think looking at more indicators helps us to better understand uh, whether the more circumscribed explorations of the scenario space um, are capturing the robustness of a variety of indicators. Instead of just focusing on one, we can see how it performs across um, several indicators in many different policy futures. Uh, and then we're looking at an uncertainty space. We have kind of three broad categories of uncertainty uh, that are controlled by six parameters. Uh, the first two have to do with how AVs could impact travel costs. Um, they could change the auto operating costs uh, and travel times on the network uh, as they change operations. Uh, they could lift some of the capacity restrictions for infill as parking lots are open for redevelopment. Uh, and then they could also change the value of access and accessibility. Um, so we have two parameters related to kind of how households generally value accessibility. Uh, and then one parameter uh, that is specific to how households value their distance from their place of work when looking at a new household location. So now I'm gonna briefly get into the results um, and hopefully it'll give you an idea for kind of why uh, the Latin hypercube turns out to be somewhat useful um, and why this entire scenario discovery uh, process might have some benefit. 
Uh, so let's look at just the Latin hypercube sample uh, to start. Um, this is a table of the number of failures um, for each. So at, across the bottom, we're looking at how at the policies um, and across the right or across the rows, we're looking at the different, excuse me, the bottom, we're looking at the indicators across the rows, we're looking at the policies. Uh, so for instance, uh, in the baseline scenario, uh, we, the policy was a failure in, in encouraging households to locate in the core uh, 35 out of the 100 runs. Um, in this case, uh, the red colors are the redder colors indicate more robust um, performance. Uh, for instance, you can see that transit oriented development, early transit oriented development uh, is fairly robust across a variety of indicators. Uh, interestingly, it fails to encourage households in the core quite as much uh, because Washington DC has uh, quite a sprawling rail system uh, that opens up a lot of development area in Montgomery County, Fairfax and Prince George's County. Uh, and those areas are often very popular um, when households are able to move there. Uh, so this gives you an idea of how scenario discovery can uh, kind of measure the robustness of policies across a variety of indicators. And this is kind of one sample of the many uh, boxes that we drew with the patient rule induction method um, to look at when these policies fail. Um, one of these boxes was drawn for every single uh, combination of policy and indicator. So in this case, we're looking at the baseline, baseline policy um, and when it encourages households in the core and when it fails to do that. Um, we can see in this case that when the distance to work is kind of minimal, the preference for distance to work is minimal, and when travel times on the network are more restrained, uh, then the regret from not choosing, say, a transit-oriented development or, or a gas price policy uh, is much higher. That is to say that in our more familiar conditions and conditions that are more similar to today, that uh, automated vehicles had minimal impact, uh, our policy options are more effective if we go away from the baseline the baseline policy. Uh, on the other hand, if the impacts of automated vehicles are more radical, if people are now willing to live much further from work and travel times on the network um, have decreased substantially, uh, then we are seeing the, policy, the relative policy effectiveness of going away from the baseline future is less. Uh, so I won't get into a lot more of the prim boxes, um, but I will say that in addition to early transit oriented development being kind of the more robust uh, policy across several indicators, uh, that that pattern we noticed with uh, the baseline scenario and promoting households in the core uh, tended to be true across a lot of indicators and a lot of policies, that it seems like the introduction of more extreme AV scenarios uh, blunted a lot of our policy instruments. Um, for instance, when we open up transit-oriented development capacity uh, in the core and in the inner suburbs, that was most effective when households felt the greatest need to live close to the core, live close to jobs, live close to accessible locations. Um, the policy still outperforms other policies uh, when the AV scenarios are more extreme, when they're more radical. Uh, but its outperformance is severely diminished. Um, so this is a really interesting finding um, that the introduction of ABs could blunt a lot of our, um, what we think of as our typical instruments um, for encouraging more compact development. Uh, and then the final thing that I looked at is like, how did the use of the Latin hypercube compare to these two other ways of looking at the uncertainty scales? Uh, I mean, the first thing we notice is that the exploratory scenario approach and the convex hull um, were not total disasters. Uh, they didn't sample the space in such a way that they have no resemblance um, to the more complete exploration of the space. Uh, however, 
the very small sample size, eight runs or nine runs, uh, makes them very vulnerable to one or two um, unusual samples. Uh, and I should say that eight or nine runs is actually being generous. Most exploratory scenarios have three, four, five, six, maybe at most scenarios. Um, so even giving eight or nine runs uh, is being fairly generous. Um, but what is perhaps uh, another important result is not just that you know the robustness is very sensitive when you're doing such few runs, um, but performing the prim analysis to understand contingencies uh, really becomes non-viable. Um, I ran the algorithm, but when you're dealing with six uncertainties and eight runs, it's just very hard to locate when a policy is performing better relative to other policies uh, and when it is not. So it was only in the case of the 100 runs uh, that we really got sensible results out of that. Um, I should say maybe that, you know, moving forward, there's nothing magical about the 100 runs. Um, I'm interested in looking at, well, what if we do 25 or 50? Um, or what if we, you know, move to a meta modeling approach um, where we build, we use machine learning uh, to build a facsimile of these results, get um, okay, 10,000, 100,000 runs, um, and see how it compares um, to our 100 runs. Thank you very much. Uh, again, Dan Engelberg, and great to speak to all of you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, I'm going to pass it next to Rachel to provide some uh, thoughts on both of these. Sure. Um, hello. Thank you. Um, so I believe I have three questions that I, I need to kind of on in terms of, of, of my responses. Um, so uh, first of all, great presentations. Um, and I think both methodologies have their place um, for sure. Um, and I think that goes back to what um, Greg said in his initial presentation, right? Um, one focusing on accuracy, one focusing on certainty and where we wanna focus on which methodology is best depends on what we're trying to analyze. Uh, so the you know, what I see is, is that, first of all, any, anything we do is gonna be better what, than what the current norm is in terms of uh, analyzing uh, different policies and, and running our models for different situations. Um, I see the, the retrospective um, methodology in, is specifically the one, that, you know, uh, which Odd was focusing on in terms of um, taking past data um, and comparing it to existing counts, um, past counts, past forecasts, comparing to existing counts and such, and, and figuring out where the error lies. I mean, that type of analysis, you know, is uh, in, important when we really do need accuracy. So toll analysis, um, cost-benefit analysis, trade-offs, um, uh, break-even analysis, um, where we, you know, if you're gonna build this particular road versus another particular road or uh, whether to build a toll road at all, um, incorporating this type of analysis seems ideal. Um, and, uh, but I think it does, it, and, and that's where I think that that, that can really um, help help the field in that one. And might be even kind of better than, than some of the traditional, um, you know, risk analysis that is a little bit more similar to to um, Daniel's presentation in terms of the uncertainty analysis and just looking forward. Um, so really utilizing past data, um, good in analysis of it, and then you know being able to to see where the the true kind of percentiles are in terms of that. Um, I think there's limitations in the fact that it's very data intensive. Um, so being able to get good source of data um, for understanding how our models um, are um, incorrect. Um, it requires a lot of data. Um, but I also think that's also where we can do better. Um, I think in terms of when we build models, we kind of reset, right? Every few years, we're like, okay, well, we have a new household travel survey. Let's reset our model based on existing new inputs for this year. And then we're gonna forecast out. 
Whereas, you know, really feeding off of, okay, well, what did, what was our, you know, model from 10 years, you know, our household travel survey from 10 years ago, from 10 years before that, like, what are those patterns telling us? Um, maybe we shouldn't be completely resetting. Maybe we should be utilizing that information to then better build the next model. So really working towards, you know, more of a, a time series type of, you know, analysis and, and modeling of, and building our models. Um, and then, if, you know, the Daniel's presentation on, on you know, incorporating uncertainty um, is obviously better for places where we really want to look at um, really trying to take into account maybe these disruptors that might happen, um, right? AV scenarios um, uh, and, and such that we really can't use past, past data for. Um, and I was, what was I gonna say on terms of that one as well? Um, and, and so really where we need to um, start looking at, uh, um, you know, wh what's the best policy given all these different things that might happen and how do they interact with each other? And how can we really, it, it, we don't care as much on the accuracy, we care more about how they are affected by all these different um, uh, inputs, uh, you know, different situations that, that, it might, that might occur. Um, but I also think that to do that best, you ideally, we get, use some information from the past to be able to feed that information, right? So um, how well uh, we, um, and also incorporate uncertainty within our model in those analysis of the uncertainty process. Um, right. So if we're not, you know, entirely sure that our, you know, value of time is correct within our model, um, we can utilize past information on analyzed analysis of value of time to then put that in as an uncertainty um, surrounding value of time um, to then see how that also affects and interacts with, you know, other things that, that you'd be trying to analyze. Um, so I, I I don't think one is a bubble of another, but I think in terms of where your focus is on terms of how you go about the analysis and what techniques you want to use depends on, on the policies uh, of interest. Um, so I think um, those, are, those are my main um, um, points in, in, in terms of that. Um, I'll, I'll let Tara jump in. Thank great, thanks. This is uh, really great. I'm so excited to talk about uncertainty because I feel like, um, you know, I've just feel it's so important for us to not have one future um, anymore because I think in the past we have had a very linear approach to more VMT, more autos, more auto ownership. There's, it's been on a pretty linear path until probably about five years ago and then we got Uber and we got scooters and we've got you know, fuel prices, and we're going to have to raise some revenue here. So pricing policies. So we don't really have a lot of past history to a lot of this stuff. And so I think uh, it's not really honest and transparent for us as a profession to say that there is one single future and to keep polishing that single future and trying to get more and more accurate when we know that there are some wildly different futures out there that we, um, it's important for our decision makers to consider those. Um, and I guess what's exciting to me is that we're in this COVID environment, um, not exciting for COVID, but um, for the modeling profession in general, that people are saying the models, they're not right. They're not telling us the right number of beds that we need. Well, models are only as good as the assumptions. And if we don't know what the assumptions on the future are, um, you know, we, we need to keep trying the models with different scenarios and so forth. So I think we're in a time where, where the public maybe is starting to accept that we don't have to give them one future. Um, and so I think that, that you know, it's a, a good opportunity for us to sort of break open and look at the techniques that help us get to there. So I think um, from Jawad and, and um, Dan both providing this retrospective and um, prospective, this is just a really great time to be thinking about this. Um, and so I guess when I think of those two techniques, um, the retrospective, um, I think this is a really great uh, quantitative approach to look at data that we do have and as, um, Greg mentioned the last webinar from Hannah and so forth at MIT there, with the robust decision making. Or, um, anyway, so that was talking a bit about how um, our decisions 
even if we don't know what they are in the future, we can look at what we've done in the past and kind of put some bounds on that and help us to look forward with that. So I think that's what Jawad is doing with that retrospective approach. And I would even extend that almost to not just our models and how they've done against um, uh, the, the predictions that they make, say, for the volume on a road um, and, the, and the needs for a facility, but I would also say it, it, you could go and get some real-time data. So what I've been struggling with lately is, uh, you know, our travel models are really good at recurring congestion capacity, but they're not as good at non-recurring congestion. So um, without going to a DTA, that takes a lot of time and you can have even fewer scenarios with those. I mean, I think we need to do that for the detailed, but maybe we could bound it by some real-time speed data that tells us where the non-recurring happens and what the possible envelope of non-recurring has been in the past. Maybe we could do some of this um, quantile regression to look at what the range of non-recurring congestion is and bound it. And that would tell us what the opportunity is if we just totally got rid of it. Anyway, I think there's some opportunities on there when we look back at that data. So exciting to get some new techniques. And then on the other side where we look forward, um, you know, I think again, I would echo what I've heard from all the panelists here that, you know, we need the, the forecast to be relevant, which projects are robust to these features. So we don't have to get any one forecast right. We just have to know if this is the right direction we should go now, given our best assumptions and given what we know of the risks of maybe a black swan somewhere. So we need to look at some of those black swans and, and find out when they're gonna happen under what conditions and start to plan for that. Uh, I'm actually even harking back to uh, 2014 uh, presentation from TRB or it was a webinar from the Port of LA where they said, should we build um, under climate change with sea level rise, should we change our port in terms of its you know, container investment to address this? And they actually set up some triggers and they said, well, only when the probability of this thing happens gets higher than this in combination with these other four things happen. So not only did they actually forecast forward and say, uh, you know, it's probably not something we need to do right now because the probabilities aren't high enough. They actually went to a next level and said, well, when this condition happens, the forecast will be high enough that it would make sense for us to do that. So then you can actually have a monitoring phase of um, how to track that over time and, and re revisit that forecast when conditions change because we know conditions will change. Um, so with that, I might open up a little to, to questions. Should I send it back to you, Greg? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Some great thoughts. And um, uh, please, if folks have questions for any of the panelists, um, either uh, type your question into the chat box or say, hey, um, uh, hey, can I speak? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull up a few that uh, show up here and um, grab them. So uh, let's see, I've got from John Glebe. There's a question. Uh, when forecasting for a development, uh, this is for Jawad, when forecasting for a, a traffic for a development impact assessment, there's a comparison of build versus no build scenarios. The quantile envelope approach will likely show significant overlap between the two scenario envelopes. What guidance can you provide for evaluating impacts under uncertainty in this situation? Uh, yeah, that's a great question, but uh, something we haven't looked at, but we would love to look at it, uh, provided the data. Yeah, I think I think it's a great question. One thing I will note is if you look at the, the UK does these post-opening project evaluations, and one of the things some of those project evaluations look at is they will look at, they'll compare the no build forecast to pre-project traffic counts and then the build forecast to post-project traffic counts. So there might be something you could do along those lines, but it's not something that was dealt with in this project. Let's see, let me grab a couple more here. So I've got Hani Mamasani says, panelists, recognizing possible alternative futures is important and scenario-based approaches have been around for many years. Equally, if not more important, are questions of how we may get there. The evolution is more important than some arbitrary point in the future. Urban systems spend more time in evolutionary mode than its steady state. Uh, would anyone like to sort of comment on that? 
or uh, uh, Hani, if you'd like, I can sort of let you comment on that uh, uh, if there's anything uh, further you'd like to say, but let me send it first to the panelists. Uh, yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I think that has a lot to do with uh, thinking about the tools that we're gonna use in these future looking approaches, as well as um, how we wanna analyze the data. Uh, so, you know, the tool that I was working with Silo does produce a year by year time series. Um, there are even more intensive um, land use micro simulations that keep, you know, records of every home sale uh, in the system. So, you know, we, uh, we have models that can produce that kind of data, at least in my world. Uh, the question is, how do we look at that data? I've seen um, in the decision-making under deep uncertainty literature, uh, I've seen, which, which comes a lot from environmental planning, uh, which is another field that is very concerned with not just the endpoint, but the trajectories. If you have overshoot at a point, uh, that can be catastrophe. Um, so, They've used, uh, I've seen approaches that have used machine learning to kind of group different trajectories and understand the conditions under which those trajectories are likely to occur. Um, but I think that there it needs to be a lot more investigation of how we look at scenarios as we're developing, not just as a you know, single point in the future, um, but a whole time series and understanding those patterns. Excellent. Hani, does that address your question or is there anything else? I think you had a follow-up. Yeah, yeah, actually, the, the, you know, the follow-up was the actual question was uh, how, how one proposes to incorporate the dynamics of the process in the scenario space exploration. Uh, I very much appreciate the notion of, you know, of looking for robustness in a, in a way, but really, um, None of the points uh, that one may, may like or be focusing on are likely to occur exactly in that mode. And most of the time we are going to be in some sort of state that may be taking us in that direction, but then what happens beyond that as well. So uh, um, it, it's it's more of, a, of, a, of, a, of an approach to planning, I think, uh, here uh, that recognizes that, 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 that the, the path to get there is probably just as important as the end point. And um, I think as a community, we probably need to gear our methods uh, to, towards addressing um, some of these questions. So it's just some comment in that way. Thanks. Yeah. I have a couple of comments. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I agree. I think that's, that's super important. And I'm not sure all variables um, are path dependent as much as, you know, land use clearly is path dependent, some of those longer term decisions. Um, so I, I do think that's important. And it's important. I think Rachel was the one to point out, you know, fine tuning um, what those things are. And then there, so there's different forecasting, you know, that you might do for fine tuning. And then there's some forecasting you would do for exploring futures. I think some of the exploring futures, you may not know how you're going to get there. You just are saying, what if we get there in an aspirational way or, you know, could be a negative way. Um, but what if we get to this state? Do we want to be there or not? Um, and then if we don't want to be there, we figure out what are the paths that get us there. And then it's important to have this path dependency to understand how that path might get us there. Or if we want to get there, you know, we do the reverse. But um, in some sense, maybe we can skirt that issue by just saying, what if, you know, is this a desired state we want? And then have tools that maybe are more detailed and take more uh, computational effort to um, actually play that out through the path dependence. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. I think that stresses to, to me even more so the importance of the dynamics of getting there because particularly if you can agree and you can have consensus on some desirable future, um, how you get there um, in terms of the interventions uh, that, that one is applying becomes very important. But the thing is, none of the interventions are, the effect of intervention is not that of an, just an exogenous variable. There are so many endogenous factors and second order effects that are gonna be taking in conjunction with, with, with whatever um, sort of uh, end goal policy uh, one might be considering. And I think that, that in fact, uh, um, reinforces, in, in my view, the 
importance of, of having a, a better handle uh, on, 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 on the path to get there from a normative perspective in particular. It is challenging computationally. Yeah. <laughs> well, so this is the age of uh, computing. <laughs> Excellent. I wanted to pass it here to Dave Ori, who had a, a question. Thanks, Greg. Uh, yeah. So my question, I guess, in, implicit or it seemed implicit in both the presentations, you could have a, you could have both had a slide at the beginning that that said, you know, the problem with conducting forecasting with an awareness of uncertainty is, is we just don't have the technical tools to do it well. And I, I guess, I wanted to ask if, if we could make that explicit. Do do the presenters or discussants think that the primary problem of, of doing this work is that we don't have the technical capacity or are there other problems with doing this that they may want to discuss or, or confirm? I can take a first go at this. <laughs> um, I mean, I think getting more tech, uh, you know, technical tools, right, that make it easier to do this or, or make it um, cheaper or whatnot, um, or do it in a better way um, is definitely part of the problem, right? That, that I think we're at this point in, you know, the, the world of travel demand modeling and, and land use, you know, modeling and such to be able to do that, right? I mean, that's, that's where kind of we are in terms of finding those tools. We're recognizing that there, we need to address it and we're trying to find the tools to be able to do so. But it's, you know, I don't think we're going to solve it by getting a perfect model that that is able to handle uh, or perfect methodology to be able to handle it. Um, for, first of all, um, there's going to be uncertainties that we don't even know about, right? Um, so as much as we can try to figure out all the different um, disruptors and input variables that we need to tweak and have, you know, ranges about, um, we're still going to be wrong, right? Because there's still models. Um, and there's still something that we're not going to be able to, to handle. So I think as technical as we can get, it's still not going to, you know, be able to do this perfectly. Um, so no, I don't think that's the entire entire issue. And then it's also an issue of, of reframing the way we think um, and reframing the people who use our models um, think and, and saying and trying to convince them that, you know, we're providing a model here. We're not, we're not providing you know, the absolute answer. It's, and being able to communicate that and, ha and having them be able to understand that we need um, to analyze it in this way and we need to put the resources towards analyzing this way and therefore we are going to get a better outcome overall. It may not be the correct, um, you know, exact volume on a road, but it's gonna be the best, you know, um, most you know, robust and best option. Um, and this is Tara, I would um, back that idea that what, what tools ultimately are doing is supporting a conversation of policy major makers um, and the public to make decisions. So it, it, at the end of the day, boils down to the cognitive abilities of us to get our heads around all these options and then decide the best path forward given those. So technical tools are a tool to support that. Um, and I think what I've run up against in some of my work with, say, Vision of Al is we run lots of scenarios and the scenarios are fast to run now, but it's sort of getting your head around what's the story that comes out of those scenarios. Um, you know, what, what, are we, what does the space tell us? And so I think some of the robust decision making that I'm seeing has sort of a workbench of ways to visualize um, all the different scenarios and sort of, sort of group them into a story and a narrative that we could actually talk and support a conversation with our decision makers. And so I think at the end of the day, that's where we're trying to head. So yes, technical tools are needed to sort of help us and they can help us get better. But at the end of the day, it's gonna be our cognitive framework um, that is, somewhat constraining here. And I think we're in a, in a new realm where we're just getting people to think about uncertainty. Once we get them to think about uncertainty, then we can start to expand different models and frameworks for exploring things. So it's, it's a challenge. You know, you throw a new visual up, a, up with someone and you have to spend a lot of time explaining it. We don't have to explain some of our heat maps on VMT these days because people have had decades to, to look at those. What are the new maps that we need to help explain the uncertainty in our forecasts? 
Yeah, I would I would follow up on that, and and uh, Dave, you can answer this as well if it's been you. But those of you who have presented uh, uh, sort of scenarios or ranges of results to decision makers, how is that received? Not great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I think the I, I, like I think the MW Cog example that Dan presented was good, right? I mean, the reality is that MW Cog is in 1990 telling the mayor of DC or the, who's ever going to vote for their regional plan on that board, that they're going to have declining population and there's implications potentially for funding programs. But MW Cog's objective is not necessarily to generate the most accurate forecast for DC. Their objective is probably to get the regional plan adopted so that they can keep the funding uh, stream. And, you know, the realities of talking to decision makers is, uh, you know, to Tara's point, it's really hard. Oftentimes you have about five minutes to present your forecasting results for a regional plan. Um, and in those five minutes, you know, <laughs> that's kind of what you have. So I agree with Tara that it's, it's probably a decades long pro progress, but I think orienting how we talk about our research and our, you know, around the practical problem would, would be beneficial. Yeah, I, I think we're always going to, we're always going to be pushing up against our technical limitations and we're always going to be looking at new tools. But in the end, um, to me, this research is much more about, you know, understanding the tools as we have them and what they're capable of right now. Um, but I definitely don't think that the kind of primary, um, the primary bottleneck in thinking about uncertainty is like, oh, we need to get that, you know, great tool on the fast computer. I think it has a lot more to do with um, communication and planning process um, and what happens when you're bringing broader publics into these conversations about uncertainty as we're seeing with COVID right now. Um, so for me, kind of the action of the tool is uh, very much just one puzzle because I can't even start to try to communicate about the tool and bring it into a process until I really understand its capabilities. But I think that's a little bit of where the COVID is kind of explaining that um, there isn't, you know, because I'm still getting people, um, policymakers off the sort of idea that the model is going to optimize something and give them one answer, right? Here's the one future you have. Now decide, you know, what you want to do, it, you know? I, so I think that COVID is telling us that one future is based on a bunch of assumptions that might change tomorrow. I mean, who knew that singing was going to be like a big transmitter of, a flu, you know, I mean, I guess you kind of knew when you look back at it, but it wasn't the first thing I went to. So we need to play out a bunch of futures and and tell them, you know, hey, you have a bias towards not wanting um, the, the central city to decline. But what if it did? Where would that go? Let's play that out just so that we have that in the back of our mind and we can think about that. Maybe you don't want to choose that at this point, but when it comes up, you won't be flat footed. So I think we have to be a little bit more honest. And I think COVID is telling us that there are, the models are only as good as our assumptions. And so let's lay out and be transparent about our assumptions and talk about the risks that come with those assumptions. Cool, thanks. I'm gonna pass it to Matthew Conway who had a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, uh, would you like to follow up on any of those or ask any of those uh, uh, live here? Yeah, I think Jawad got to my question, but I had two questions more technical for Dan after this interesting discussion of the less technical aspects. So. Just first of all, very basic question, are the margins of the Latin hypercube, are those just uniformly distributed? And then my second question was, when we're talking about running a model a hundred or a thousand times with commodity cloud computing like Amazon Web Services, is that like, are we able to, you know, implement all the, run all those model runs simultaneously? So, you know, if it takes six hours to run one, it also takes six hours to run a thousand if we use a thousand machines, right? Uh yeah, first point, uh, yeah, the borders of the Latin hypercube are really distributed. Uh, I have seen some work that has um, kind of distorted the borders so as to uh, oversample in kind of the extreme range. Uh, that, you know, given the results that I saw that the extreme areas are, are somewhat representative, at least in case that there's not too many linearities, um, Maybe it does make sense to oversample in the extreme areas, but still ensure that we're sampling sufficiently from uh, kind of the center of the distribution. Uh, 
as for the potential of you know high processing computing um, online and accessible and cheap um, I think that there is a lot of promise in that um, honestly uh, I am not the uh, I am not the uh, wisest person in the, the kind of software hardware integration let's get a million runs kind of thing um, but it's something that as I continue to move I am kind of curious about the, the bounds for um, getting uh, getting these models to run many more times. I think one of the challenges of it is often that, or at least that I have experienced, um, is that very often these models are um, such unique beasts uh, that, that, that their effort on getting it up and into one of those systems. Um, but once you have it there, um, that I think there's a lot of potential. Thank you. Excellent. Um, and uh, Tushar, I think you had a question as well. Uh, thank you. Uh, just wanted to confirm with Jawad about uh, his data and his analysis. Uh, did you find um, that forecast before a certain time like 2010 were less accurate than the newer forecast in my follow-up questions where did you find similar stuff in transit versus roads and within roads did you find something with toll is better or worse than the normal other non-toll roads yeah thank you very much um, so i'm looking at the set of results here so it seems that from uh, after 2010 the forecast performance has gone better like for example in the uh, between uh, in the decade of 2010 to 2010 2001 to 2010 the mean absolute percent difference from forecast was 15.79 percent whereas after 2010 it decreased to 11.83 percent so there is a definite improvement after 2010 and the other reason is uh, we want the forecasting model to be useful at the time of forecast so if you're you if you're forecasting now it should definitely be after 2010 and it should incorporate all the te uh, technical advantages or advancements we have experienced since 2010. About transit versus roads. Uh, okay, transit, uh, we haven't looked at transit in this research yet, uh, okay. specifically on traffic forecasts and we don't have data, much data on toll roads as well. Okay, thanks. I had a general comment about, I know the uncertainty space is uh, important to know uh, the overall, the probability of 5% all to 95% all and stuff like that. But when you are ready to go and uh, implement a project, I guess after decision is made to implement a project, our designers or financiers really latch on one number and they do need one number. And so I just wanted to point out that that, that need is still gonna be there regardless of uh, our explorations over there. Yeah. Excellent. And I just wanted to touch base here. Is there anyone who I didn't call on um, that wants to ask a question? I'm not sure if I got everyone here. And so if you, uh, I missed you, please speak up. And is there anyone who didn't get their question addressed uh, sufficiently that would like to chime in? I might just add to um, uh, the question with Jawad on the work that you guys had done with the NCHRP. It sounds like that does focus on um, traffic. Uh, are you guys thinking that you will expand that to transit and land use maybe and, and other areas? So you, I mean, it sort of is dependent. You know, you had a nice 2,500 project sample to, to pull from there. Um, what are the prospects for other types of projects? Yeah, so I guess, Juwa, do you want to talk about sort of the, the plans for transit here? Uh, yeah, so um, for transit, we have, uh, we are in a collection of good enough database with about 120 projects from the new STARS program. Uh, so we can definitely expand this analysis on that. Uh, in fact, that is what I'm proposing for my PhD. So I'll be working on that uh, transit, but for toll roads, uh, we're not, really sure about the source of data, but it'd be nice to have, have it as well. Cool. Cool. 
Um, if there's nothing else, I think uh, I think we ought to wrap up here. It's been an hour and 20 minutes. This has been great, and I appreciate the engagement in the discussion. I want to thank again both our uh, our presenters and our discussants here, uh, as well as all the participants. Um, we have coming up a few more if you check out the Zephyr website. Um, data, in June, there will be Data Standards Panel and Machine Learning 101 are the next few. Please go to zephyrtransport.org to check out uh, uh, what's going to happen next on those. And there'll be a series of these coming uh, about two a month uh, until November or so. So we look forward to uh, hearing more from you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Take care.